Hello and welcome to Bandwidth Conversations, a podcast that finds out about the stories and journeys of rock stars of life. I'm Katie Brewer, and I'm going to start today's conversation with a couple of quotes. Aristotle said, knowing yourself is the beginning of all wisdom. Sir Thomas Brown said, all wonders you seek are within yourself. My guest today said the following, you can only have a clear vision of the future if you have an honest knowledge of the present. So here are some questions for you. Would you like to better understand your character and personality traits, your path in life, and reveal the genius and potential within you? Would you like to decrease your stress in inner conflict? Would you like to find peace within yourself and with others? Would you like to have a healthier, less guilty relationship with food? I don't know about you, but I want all those things. I read self-help books, but then don't put them into practice. I try meditating, but all I end up doing is writing a to-do list in my head or thinking about who I'm finding annoying that day or fixating on whatever my worries are. When it comes to food, actually, my daughter Lara and I have a great relationship with food. We love it. We can't get enough of it. Why have one chocolate brownie when you can eat five? We decided to see if we could learn some self-control and we found through friends of friends my guest today. And I can quite honestly say seeking her advice and coaching last year was one of the best things I did in 2022, possibly ever. A real rock star of life. Part of her genius is that she is so down to earth and funny. I've asked her to share some of her insights with us today, and I'm very grateful she said yes. So from South Africa via Zoom, I am delighted to be talking to Loretta Ferrucci. Hi, Loretta. Thank you so much for being here today. Thank you so much for inviting me, Katie. It's lovely to be here. So, Loretta, you're a healer, a homeopath, an author, a national and international speaker, and a teacher. You are dedicating your life to helping others connect with their true purpose and therefore increase their general well-being, health, vitality, and joy. You guide sick people to wellness, and you are setting up health clinics to be accessed by all across South Africa. What was it about your childhood and your own journey about you that led you to choose this path? The short version is that I decided to become a homeopath to harmonize my mother's anxiety around illness because when I was about two and a bit, I developed a seizure disorder and no one could find out what the cause was. And it created enormous anxiety in my family. My father must have taken at least three days off work to go to Johannesburg to go and see a neurologist to go find out what was going on. They could find nothing. And someone recommended that my mother take me to see a homeopath. I don't know what the homeopath said, but whatever the homeopath said and whatever she gave me, it was the end of the seizure disorder. And so my mother, who actually grew up in a conservative Afrikaner household, you know, was actually a very free thinking, had quite a leaning towards the esoteric, but kept it in the closet. And it was right up her alley. And so the the homeopath became our general practitioner. And um, yeah, so when it was time to go and study, I became a homeopath. But I was always interested in the reason behind the reason. And so, you know, homeopathy aims to treat not the disease, but treat the patient and see each patient as an individual. Um, And then I studied traditional Chinese medicine. So I got the whole organ energetic thing thrown in it. And basically I was was scared witless because I was 24 years old, graduated, and then had to, I don't know, present myself to sick people. And I was like, well, I don't actually know anything. And it's not just sick people, actually. I need to qualify that. It's often sick people who've tried everything and haven't managed to get better. Because, you know, the weird doctor is like the last in the chain, basically. So when they've had all the tests and they've had all the specialists and no one actually knows what's going on, that's when they come to me and like, oh my God, if they don't know what's going on, how am I going to know what's going on? So that got me into the realm of energy medicine and that then led to the whole mind-body connection and human behavior because I did realize that people change their diets, they can change their lifestyles, but if they don't change fundamentally what is going on in terms of the causation of their disease, then uh, it's just going to come back. And so I was fascinated by what is that? Like, what is that thing? You know, can we uncover that thing? And so in part, it was my own insecurity. Like, if I found that, then I would never get like deathly ill and wouldn't be able to recover. I mean, I I see that now. So, you know, I was constantly trying to allay my own fears of illness based on probably my childhood illness and my mother's fear of anybody getting ill. That led me into complementary medicine. When you look back at your illness that you had when you were so little, can you think what the cause of that might be when no one could find anything particularly wrong? Oh, yes. So I mentioned I was the third of three children. My sister was 10 years older than I am, and my brother was seven years older than I am. And my sister was like my second mother. As much as I love my mother, and I was never in doubt that my mother loved me, she wasn't really a baby kind of person, but my sister was very much 
And at the time that I was about two, and so my sister was just going into her teenage years. And I remember there was a story that was told my whole family life that my sister was revolting for a year. And my mother dealt with it by just ignoring her. I suspect what happened was my second mother, my very affectionate sister, turned into this revolting teenager that didn't want a three-year-old around. And my mother was just not really available because she never had to be. And so it was a bid to get their attention. And I definitely got a lot of attention. So, you know, that agenda certainly, certainly worked. And I played the, I unconsciously played the get sick card a lot during my childhood. And it was always weird. It was always like a weird thing that nobody could really diagnose. And a blood test could never find it. But you know, a homeopath could cure it. Well, I think because it was mostly psychosomatic in retrospect. Yeah, that's so interesting. All totally unconscious. Totally. I mean, what, what did I know? My father was Italian. So like typical Italian, you know, hot, fiery, temperamental. My mother gave as good as she got. I mean, nobody in my family is a shrinking violet by any manner of means. So my perception is I was born into this family where everyone was bigger than me, that everyone was older than me, everyone could shout louder than me. And I was a a very introverted and very shy and sort of very sensitive. And somehow I worked out that I would get my mother's attention if I was sick. I probably had seen it before. You know, if someone else got sick, my mother was always the one who had to sort it out. All unconscious and it worked. Did get me what I... (laughs) What I wanted, I wouldn't recommend it. No. <laughs> <laughs> because, you know, that can turn into sort of very serious kind of pathological structures. And fortunately, I recognized it early enough. But yeah, that was how it worked. That was the start of your search to really understand what we're here to do, what holds us back. And so I'd love to split those things into, into three, which is to figure out what we want to create in our lives. Second one is what holds us back. And then the third is this kind of weird relationship we all have with food. (laughs) So let's start with what we want to create, because on this podcast, I talk to a lot of musicians and actors, and they are very lucky in a way because they talk about, or a lot of them talk about picking up that instrument for the first time and just knowing that's what they wanted to do or going to the theater for the first time and just thinking that this is where I want to be. So it doesn't mean they're going to get there. It doesn't mean they're going to have an easy time of it, but it makes things simpler because they know. But for the rest of us, we don't know. We're not sure. I love my podcasting and my singing and my writing. But I do have this kind of feeling, you know, that when the day of reckoning comes that, you know, I'm going to go, I hope I'm going somewhere, but, um, <laughs> but uh, you know, there's going to be someone with a clipboard and I, you know, maybe it's an angel, maybe it's a swirl of energy, <laughs> maybe hopefully it's not someone, you know, dressed in black with flames everywhere, but you know, don't know. And they might say, well, yeah, you were faffing around down there, Katie. That's all very well. But actually, your purpose, you the reason you were put there was to do X. But, you know, maybe it's you know, be a doctor or something like that. And we're all going to roll our eyes and go, no, didn't do that. And, you know, what a shame. So how do we figure out what our true purpose is in the world? Some of us fall into the purpose, okay, particularly if you associate purpose with vocational job. So the people that we say are lucky that they found them. So like, I am lucky. I fell into my purpose. But that's only because my purpose is my job. All right. So if my purpose was to be a homemaker and I was questing around for what am I going to do in the world other than bring up my children, then I would be unlucky, right? Well, because I couldn't find my vocation in the world. So I think we have to be very, very clear that you your purpose can fall in any category of life. So you can have a predominantly a spiritual purpose. You can become like a minister of religion, or you can want to become a guru, or you want to become a devotee, or you want to become one of those people who are breatharians and sit in caves for their whole life and just, you know, I don't know, beam energy to the world, right? You can have a spiritual purpose. You can have a familial purpose. Your purpose can be relationships. Your purpose can be friendships. Your purpose can be making money. Your purpose can be having a vocation. Your purpose can be having a social responsibility, or it could just be having a really big network of friends that you can influence. And they in turn are then going to influence people. Or your purpose could be to be the most beautiful, physically, the most beautiful human specimen ever, or to be an athlete, or to be super healthy and vibrant. And so your purpose is not your vocation. It's very helpful in our sort of society. And how we measure things. Exactly. Because if you happen to have a job that falls in alignment with what is considered to be your purpose, then we call that like a good thing. 
You know, so it's like Loretta's really living her purpose. Katie's faffing around. Okay, well, that's not true at all because Katie's also living her purpose. And so Eckhart Toll, I think it was in A New Earth, he said that your current purpose is to be right here, right now. So your purpose, Katie, is talking to me and my purpose is talking to you, which means you can't ever be off your purpose. No one's ever not living their purpose. Never. And then there is what you do in the world. So I would go as far as to say your purpose is who you are in the world. And then what you do in the world is just a reflection of that. And you could be doing it in any area of life. So purpose is not always vocation. That's number one. Although it's very helpful if you can do what you love and get paid to do it. But even you know, from that point of view, even so my job, for example, is actually not my purpose. My purpose, again, and, and I mean, I can tell you how I come about this, but my purpose is essentially to take esoteric concepts that are sort of a bit hoo-hoo, not really <laughs> tangible, and put them in a way and, and, and dense them, like condense them in a way that make them easy to understand for other, other people, easy to understand and practical so that they can apply them. That's actually my purpose. So the second thing is that I think that our purpose, like purpose as human beings, everyone has the same purpose, and that is to remove the resistance to living life fully. We, everyone wants to be joyful, right? We all just want to be happy. I want to take it beyond happy. Like we want to be joyful because you can have joy even when you're sad. You can have an innate kind of joy even when things aren't going that well with you. So, so happy usually implies everything's going your way. It doesn't work like that in this three-dimensional reality. Shit happens and it happens to everyone, but we can certainly have joy. But here's the deal. If you want to live life fully, you have to embrace everything, which is the good and the bad and the ugly. And most of us are so repelled by the idea of, let's say, embracing grief and really feeling it fully, that that stops us from embracing life fully. So I think in order to find a purpose, we need to be clear about what purpose actually is and what it isn't. And so it doesn't have to be a job. The next step is you can only find your purpose, I believe, if you can connect to that part of you, which is limitless. Now, you know, if you're a religious person or a spiritual person, then we would probably call that your soul, or we could call it your higher self, or we could call it your super consciousness. And then you have your awareness, your everyday awareness, or your current consciousness, or even your unconscious. That's a sort of like your ego awareness. And so most of us create or try and find a purpose or what we love from the position of our ego. But our ego has developed in order to limit us and keep us safe and stop us from taking unnecessary risks. So your ego essentially is like a map of reality or a cage. So I have a friend, her name is Ellen Kumba. She is an amazing coach that I met only recently. And she uses this analogy and I've asked her if I can, if, if I can appropriate it. And she has said, yes, I may. So she says, imagine that your spirit or your soul, that part of you that's limitless or your higher self, whatever you want to call it, it's like a bird. It's free can fly anywhere it wants, right? It has the whole sky at its disposal. And then what happens is as we experience pain, in order to prevent ourselves from having more pain, we build a cage around ourselves. We basically build our own cage. And the cage is safe. So every fear, every limitation, every limiting belief that you have, every story that you tell about how life is, how the world is, how people are, how you are relative to that, those are all bars of your cage. Every thought, every emotion, they're all part of your cage. And your cage is associated with safety. So if someone opens the door of your cage and says, well, come on then, you can get out. You go, I'm not going out there. And then no <laughs> yeah. bars there. Right? And so some of us build ourselves the most amazing cages. So, you know, we have, our cages are opulent and they've got designer furniture in them and they've got like designer little bells and whistles and the food dispenser is amazing. Well, it's still a cage, which is why very often those of us who are privileged and live in sort of first world conditions, we are the most affluent people as humanity has ever had and the most miserable. And we have the highest rate of antidepressant and anxiolytic use. Either we, we are struggling because we've got to keep up with everyone else, or we're struggling because we've done all this stuff now and we, we're not feeling fulfilled. But that's all part of the cage. So it takes great courage to get out of the cage because once you get out of the cage, so you imagine, you know, you're a bird, the domestic bird that grew up in a cage your whole life. And now we, there's shit going down out there. There are hawks out there, you know, there are birds of prey out there. There's like bad weather. <laughs> there's all sorts of nasty things out there that you can't be protected against. And so that's why we stay in our cage. So, if you think of your higher self or your soul as that free bird, and you think of your ego reality as the cage that you've constructed, the story you've told about life, how it works, what it means to be you, what it means to be other people, 
Most of us find our purpose or we try and find our purpose from within the cage. Whatever we create from our cage is bound by the limits of our cage. That's why with SMART goals, I'm not knocking whoever discovered SMART goals, but I never know what all that, I'm terrible with acronyms, right? But I do know that the R stands for realistic. The goal must be realistic. Well, it's only going to be realistic based on what you think is your limitation, right? Whereas at the level of your soul, it doesn't have to be realistic because the how is not really your problem. So the only way you can access your soul is through your intuition or your imagination. And this is why artists can create such amazing art, generally regardless of what's going on in their lives. So, you know, they'll paint the painting, even if they have no money and they don't know who they're going to sell it to. Or, you know, they'll have the day job that kills them, but they'll have the art thing on the side that inspires them. That, And they can't stop doing that thing because they are so driven generally by what is inside that needs to come out. You could only access this through your intuition and your imagination, but no one teaches you how to do that at school. In fact, your imagination is okay when you're tiny, but the minute you tell your mother that there are fairies in the garden, she's like, no, actually. I mean, honestly, God forbid you should be two and say you saw elementals in the garden because then you get told that, you know, that's just your fertile imagination. We need to learn how to access our imagination, our intuition. It's not very difficult because you can do it in a very structured way. It's a technique. It's like anything. You can learn to paint. You might not be the next Van Gogh, but you can learn to paint a credible looking painting. You can learn how to access your intuition and use your imagination and your intuition to access what your soul is longing to express. And that also doesn't mean it's going to be easy. You know, think of the starving artists. Doesn't mean it's going to be easy, but it does mean that you are going to take action that is going to bring you joy because that's what truly like lights you up. And so most people actually don't know what they want. Most people can't find what they want because when I ask them, so what is it that you really want? What do you really want? They go, I don't know. I say, no, no, no. I don't know means I don't want to look or I don't want to admit what I really want in case someone else thinks that it's stupid or egotistical or self-aggrandizing. Or And mostly, I don't know what I want because most of us think we don't deserve what we want or we can't get what we want because we don't know how. And so it's easier to just say, I don't know. Because the minute you admit to yourself that you want this thing that you don't have, you set up what's called tension and no one likes that. So it's actually easier to just say, I don't know what I want. On some level, I think we all know what we want. And in those areas where our lives run smoothly, and we've all got this, and there's always an area or maybe two areas of life where it runs relatively effortlessly. Maybe your relationship isn't too much of a struggle, or maybe some people find making money really easy. Some people find communicating with other people and making friends really easy. So there's almost always an area of your life that just seems to be easy. That's the area in which you are most aligned automatically with what your soul is longing to express. And then the area where you have a little bit more of an issue, that's usually the area where you've got more resistance. I suppose this segues into the next one is the reason why we can't get what we want is because we have resistance to it. So, you know, once you've you've got the reality, this is what my life is like, and this is what I believe. This is what I believe about myself. This is what I believe about other people. This is what I believe about the world. This is what I think is right and wrong. All my assumptions, all my expectations, all the choices I've ever made, that's the truth of who of my reality, my ego-based reality. And then we learn how to access our soul-based reality through our intuition. So now let's say you've got these beautiful things you want to create. Okay, so the reason why it's difficult to go from here to here to shift your focus off this one and onto this one is because of how much resistance there is in the way. And the resistance is the thing that keeps us in the cage. You know, there are too many hawks out there. Someone will get me. It's not safe. I'll be lonely. Better the devil you know than the one you don't. All of that stuff that's unconsciously basically running us, that's the stuff that stops us from actually being able to create what we'd love. That's what's holding us back. And most of that is unconscious. How do you practically go into your superconscious or your soul and find out what it is you really want and also recognize what it is that's holding you back? Okay, so this is where things start getting a little bit out there for the rational thinkers. Let's say that you've invited me on this podcast and let's just assume that I was incredibly anxious about that. So what I could do is I could say, okay, so I'm going to be on Katie's podcast. So the first thing I could ask myself, this is the simplest way to do it, is to go, well, what do I, how do I feel about that and what do I think? 
So I'm like, oh my God, what if I make a fool of myself? Like, what if Katie doesn't like me? What if the people, what if no one listens to this podcast? What if they hate me? What if I look stupid? Oh, that's my worst. What if I look stupid? I'm anxious. You know, I'm nervous. That could be the reality. All right. I mean, some of the reality could be, I'm like, I'm so excited to be doing this. I love talking about myself. I mean, you know, someone said to me, oh, are you nervous? I will get to talk about me for a whole hour. What's bad about that? Okay. <laughs> so, so that could be the reality. That's my reality. And so the next question to ask yourself is when you in this situation, what do you do to cover that up or to make yourself feel better? So for me, one of my strategies, and this is a strategy, would be to be like very funny, extremely, maybe actually like I am being now, but this is actually more or less what I'm like, (laughs) but you know, like very clever, throwing out massive big terms, like making sure everyone understands that I went to university for X number of years. And, you know, I have a degree, you know, even though I'm a flake. Okay. So that would be a compensation. I'm really anxious that they're going to think I'm flaky and loopy and no one's going to like me. So my strategy to compensate for that is to make sure everyone understands how smart I actually am or how funny I am or how supremely engaging I am. So I put on that persona. That's a strategy. That's my ego trying to cover up my insecurity. Okay. So that's your reality. On a simple level, it would be, I'm anxious about the the thing. I don't want to look stupid. I don't want to disappoint Katie because I like her. I don't want her to stop liking me. Like, oh, what if she stops liking me? Okay. And so my strategy would be to like over try, to maybe try too hard, especially to come across as clever. Cause you can hear, I don't like the idea of being thought of as being stupid, right? That's reality. So now there you've got it. You've got your current reality. Now I can do a process where I step into using my imagination, my higher self. So, you know, it will take a little bit of time just to get centered, you know, take a deep breath, close my eyes. I'm just going to like do it quickly as if we were doing it. And then there are various visuals that you can use. And so one of the easiest is to imagine that, first of all, to choose to serve yourself. Because the minute you go into your heart, you shut your mind down, right? Because that's what you want to do, right? You want to connect to your intuition. You want to stop the thinking. So to serve yourself and you set an intention, you know, I want to see what my higher self thinks about my podcast with Katie. Now you create a structure. So you imagine a beautiful circle of golden light. You've created a structure. This is the structure in which my higher self is going to give me the answer I'm looking for. So you consciously adopt an attitude of like curiosity. There's all sorts of ways that you can leave the reality behind. You can literally imagine, okay, I've left all the truth of what I really, what's really going on, my ego or my insecurity. I'm going to leave that outside the circle and I'm going to step into the circle. And then there are a number of ways you can do this. So one of the ways that I do this with my clients is I said, imagine your higher self is in front of you. Now, however you think your, your higher self looks. So your higher self is in front of you. And is welcoming you and is happy to share any information you want, like anything you want to know. So, you know, you could just ask your higher self straight up, but you probably wouldn't get an answer straight away because you have got to shut this down in order to get your interest right. So, so it's more sort of relaxation and creative visualization and find yourself merging with your higher self and look at the podcast with Katie. So if I just connect to my high self and think of my podcast with Katie, I think, well, you know what? If I choose to serve Katie and I choose to serve me and I choose to serve all her listeners, then I don't have to have a strategy. And if my higher self says to me, Loretta, you know what? The authentic version of you is the best version of you. Or you know what, Loretta? Just connect to the love in your heart and just express that. And Or like, oh, I'm so excited. You know, I get to share this with whoever's going to listen to this or watch this. That's the higher self perspective. And what that does is it gives you, shall I say, the God's eye view. It's like the wise angel that is you is looking at that and going, really, Rita, you don't have to be anyone that you don't, that you're not. You really don't have to pretend. You don't have to impress anyone. Just have a conversation with her and just have fun. Just have a good time. That could be its advice. You're like, okay, all right. So, and the more I can feel into that, the more I can connect to that. I'm like, okay, I'm going to have fun. I'm going to have this conversation with this person that I really like and talk about stuff that I love talking about. I mean, really, where's the problem here? And just be who I am. And so that doesn't mean that maybe some of my strategy and some of my cover-up is not going to come in, but there's a very, very good chance that I'm going to come across from that energy. So what I've actually done is I've chosen to put my focus on what do I really want? Do I really want to look smart on Katie's podcast? Not really. Well, I mean, I'd love to, but not really. Um, What I really want is for people to be introduced to this way of living their lives. What I really want is for people to embrace life fully. I just want people to be the most joyful version of themselves. Honestly, 
I mean, that's almost as corny as world peace, but that's actually what I want, right? So if I'm focused on that, that's my higher self vision of it. How that's going to happen? So it's like, oh, well, how many people listen to Katie's podcast and how many people are actually going to get what you're saying? And is it really going to make a difference? Well, maybe it is, maybe it's not. That's not really my problem because I can't control any of that. I don't know if I just answered your question. You have, no, you have completely. (laughs) It's about what the end result is that's not focusing on you really. Exactly, exactly. And so the minute you focus on service to yourself and other people, as soon as you start thinking about what is it that you want, like every listener, like what experience would I love Katie to have? And what experience would I love Katie's listeners to have? Then I'm not thinking about, well, you know, do they think my hair is bad or am I wearing the right clothes? <laughs> or, oh my God, you know, can they see my wrinkles? Or I'm not really thinking about that, right? Because I'm thinking about, I want to express this to Katie and her audience. This is exactly like an artist, like a musician. So, you know, if you are making, why would you make music? Well, you're making music, A, because you love it, right? And you're having a good time when you're playing with other people. But almost everybody makes music so that someone else can listen to it. So, you know, if your focus is on what are you getting for them, you're automatically going to get it for you. There's no doubt about that. But when you're focusing on that, you're looking at the bigger picture. And when you're looking at the bigger picture, you take your ego insecurities, not out completely, but you take them. Because honestly, if you're focusing on what a good time they're going to have, it's almost impossible that you're not going to have a good time. Yes, that's absolutely right. It's like a muscle. If you've never, ever accessed your higher self or your intuition, your muscle is about this big. You need to do a few weights and you need to do a few weights over time. So the more you practice, the bigger the muscle gets, the easier the activity becomes for you. So that list of insecurities that I made there, those never go away. And the fact that, you know, I have this persona, I mean, I do have her, she's alive and well, but I can put her on, no problem. The way that I know whether I actually had her on or not initially was, if I was exhausted after the interaction, I was like, okay, that felt like a performance. I really worked hard at that. If I wasn't, or I was energized by it, then I was like, okay, I think maybe the real Loretta. So she's part of the real Loretta, okay? And it's she's very useful to have. So like you can have a stage persona. My daughter got me to watch a Beyonce documentary once, all right? And this thing about she's Sasha Fierce when she's on the stage, right? So she has a persona. There's nothing wrong with that. If you're consciously putting it on so that you can put on the show. The problem is these strategies that we have, we don't even know we have them. And so they're the ones that then sabotage us, you know? Most of us are just running on autopilot. And as a consequence, we're just strengthening the bars of the cage. Instead of strengthening our flat wings, we're just putting more bars on the cage so that we definitely can't get out, right? And that's when we wake up one day and we go, you know, what's the point of all of this? Why have I worked my whole life? Well, you know, I'm not happy. I'm like, you know, there's nothing wrong in my life. And then we feel guilty because, you know, we have enough money or we have a good enough relationship or we have a good enough job. And why are we feeling so unfulfilled? Well, because we're living in our cage. Yes. And we all do it in different ways. So you work overly hard as your compensatory strategy. I tend to work really hard because I've got this gremlin on my shoulder saying, you're not going to mess this up. You're going to mess this up. Oh, you have messed it up. Um, <laughs> <See>? And um, <laughs> yeah, you knew it was going to happen. And Lara, who has a different strategy, which is oh, I'm not going to be able to do this. So I won't start. Knowing it means you can catch yourself. And even if you only catch yourself momentarily, it's enough to perhaps move that focus onto. Yes. So I think the important thing that I didn't mention right at the beginning is that your focus creates your reality, not your attitude. So it's where is your focus? So if your focus is on your limitation, you know, if your focus is on, I'm never going to get this right. So I might as well not even try. That might be your strategy. Or I'm never going to get this right. So I've got to work 10 times harder than everyone else. The truth is you're probably going to mess it up. Both of us, the one that doesn't take action is going to mess it up because nothing got done, right? So now you didn't get it done and so you're in trouble. And the one that tried too hard messes it up. And so then you're in trouble also. So the result ends up being the same. And it's because the focus is on the cage. So imagine, imagine that you were in a cage trying to build something. You're limited to what you can actually do, right? You're basically standing on the perch, screaming at the people outside the cage to like move things. Whereas when you're out the cage, you can move things yourself, but it takes courage. You actually can't change the reality. That's what I'm saying. So my little list of insecurities, they're always there. I'm always anxious about messing it up. Or, I mean, that's part of my, but as soon as I name them, I'm aware of them. And then I can choose, am I going to let this run my life or am I going to focus on what I would love? So, you know, if those anxieties and insecurities get too much, I might have sent you a message two days ago and said, and made some sort of half ass excuse, or even worse, managed to allow myself unconsciously to get sick, like manufactured like an amazing head cold or something. And it's like, oh, Katie, 
so sorry, going to have to reschedule. That's how disease actually works. You know, going to have to reschedule, Katie. Sabotaging, right? You're like, oh my goodness, I can't believe this has happened. So when you're conscious of it, you can actually still go with it, but at least you're going with it consciously. You know what you're doing. So I might have been overwhelmed by anxiety and then phoned you and said, listen, Katie, actually, I'm too anxious to do this. Thank you so much. I really appreciate the invitation, but I just, I actually just can't do it right now. But you see, that would require a certain amount of vulnerability, especially in admitting that the reason why I can't do this is because I'm anxious, right? Because now what are you going to think of me now? You're going to think, oh my goodness, this woman's an anxious Annie. How can she be anybody's coach? This lady can't control her anxiety. <laughs> this is terrible. Okay. <laughs> so it takes a lot of vulnerability to sometimes act when you recognize that that's what it is, but you could still choose. But can you see that that's a conscious choice? Katie, I would love to be on your podcast, but I'm actually just too overwhelmed at the moment and too anxious. And I don't think I can do the job. So I can pander to that. If I, so I, you know what I'm saying is I don't have to reject that. I can actually go with that because that's also honoring myself, but it's conscious. I'm choosing it. And so if we segue that into food, there's a difference between whether you eat the five brownies consciously, and you probably would never eat five of them consciously. You'd eat, if you ate the first one consciously, you might eat two or three, but you probably would never get to five, honestly. Not if you were doing it. It's when we are hoovering them in, you know, like you, you've hardly even tasted the first one and it hasn't even hit your stomach yet. Okay. I mean, I'm a master of this. That's why I teach this. I mean, I'm a master <laughs> at doing that, hoovering the brownies, right? Don't get me wrong. You have to teach what you most need to learn. When it comes to food, you know, it's not about, are you eating the chocolate or are you eating the brownies? Are you eating the brownie because you really would love to eat a brownie and the way the brownie is going to make you feel? Or are you eating a brownie because you've just had a fight with your husband? He's an absolute douchebag. He doesn't understand you. He never listens. And you know what? He just doesn't get it. And you're so frustrated. You need chocolate. I've done both of those. <laughs> oh, I've done that too. <laughs> More than once. <laughs> but we do all just move on to food because you have this amazing program, which is how I got to meet you in the in the first place, which is the whole body reset program. And Kate Moss, the model, she was asked in an interview into what's her mantra and what, for looking so great. And she quoted it with someone else who said it, but nothing tastes as good as skinny feels. And then she said, of course, you know, that's all very well, but you try and remember and it and it never works. But I know that that if someone says to me, oh, Katie, you're looking a bit scrawny today, they've made my day. It's fantastic. And it's not even a compliment. But I'm constantly thinking about food. I mean, one particular friend of mine, that's all we talk about is how much we've eaten today you know, and what losers we are. So why is it that we have such complex relationships with food? I think it depends on how you, you viewed food as a child. So if food was used to soothe you, you're going to have more of a soothing relationship with food. So my mother is an Afrikaner and in the Afrikaner culture, hospitality and being hospitable and inviting people in your home and making more food than what anyone can eat, right? That was, it's like the Italians, right? So my mother was an Afrikaner who married an Italian. I mean, honestly, food was like a central <laughs> locus in my life. Okay, so how I possibly could not have grown up being food driven, I don't know. So it, it depends on that. And also it depends on how effectively we have found food to be a soother. The more soothed we are by food, the more addicted we are to it. The more that becomes our coping strategy is, you know, so I'm feeling anxious rather than admitting that I'm anxious. So, I mean, we'll shame, we'll use the poor husband, you know, they always get the flack, unfortunately. So your husband's being a douche and this is not the first time. And, you know, you feel like he doesn't listen to you. And you're not feeling heard and you're not feeling seen. And this is the most important person in your life that isn't hearing and seeing you. So having to address that, that's quite complex, right? You could love that accusation, but how well is that going to work? Because then he's going to get defensive and you guys are going to have more of a fight. And then tomorrow we're going to pretend it was all okay. And then we're going to move on again. And the same problem is still going to be there. So addressing that seems really complex. You see, now we're worrying about the how. I don't know how to fix this. This problem that I see in my relationship is so complex to me and so big, and I don't know how to fix it, that I'm not even going to attempt it. But I feel bad. I have psychological tension. We call it psychological tension. I feel bad, and I don't know how to dissipate that tension. So one way we dissipate the tension is by eating. Some people dissipate the tension by exercising. Some people dissipate the tension by working. Some people dissipate the tension by having sex. Some people dissipate the tension by going on Tinder. It's just that food is an easy, culturally acceptable one. Also, we have all the social programming. I mean, diet culture is a massive, massive thing. And we've had it inculcated in us from the time that we were tiny. So if you had a mother or a father that was health and or weight conscious, then that diet culture was part of your programming. 
So um, part of that programming is that food has morality. And so, you know, a brownie is an amoral food, but a salad without dressing, oh, that's like St. Peter at the pearly gates kind of food in terms of morality. <laughs> and, you know, the same salad with feta cheese, olives, and some dressing, that's like one of the lower angels. It's like not an archangel in terms of morality, you know, but it's not quite the demon that a brownie is. I don't know why I'm using these religious metaphors. I must be honest, <laughs> but um, they probably are doing the trick. So food doesn't have morality. Food is just food. So a brownie is a composite of macronutrients and micronutrients. And a salad is a composite of macronutrients and micronutrients. Different ones that will possibly make different people feel differently. But the food itself is not inherently good or bad. So because we ascribe a moral value to food, if you eat a good food, that makes you a good person. But if you eat bad food, what does that make you? Ooh. So then what you do is you restrict the bad food. But you know what you resist persists because now you've got resistance. The more you want it and can't have it, the more resistance to not having it builds up, which is why invariably when you do allow yourself to have it, you pig out on it. Then you hate yourself for having pigged out on it. So you have to restrict it even more. And that's what creates these cycles of being good and bad, right? That's what diet culture does to us. So food has no morality is one of the things. And listen, this is a big thing for me to get around. The idea that food has no morality. I'm still trying to unprogram my programming, all right? The other thing is that eating is also considered moral or immoral. So if you eat very little, you'll say you had a good day because you ate little, few calories. So you see, the quantity becomes moral or immoral. Can you see how subjective and actually how ridiculous this is? Because, well, because it's only moral or immoral because our culture tells us it is. So if you were living in a place that was prone to famine and you happened to like have a glut of food, no one would say, oh my God, I was so bad today. Do you know what I ate today? I ate, uh, they're saying, can you eat any more? Because when this food runs out, we're going to be in deep shit for another three months. So we better eat as much as we can, get as fat as we can so that we don't die when the famine comes. There's no morality. But because diet culture is about restriction and restricting calories, and excuse me, we've equated that with disciplined, being disciplined, being strong, being focused. Discipline is a big thing, right? And um, willpower. We associate it with having willpower. So every time we restrict, we reinforce that we have willpower and that we're good and that we've been moral, right? In other words, now we're going to heaven. Today, you ate only salad and grilled fish. Heaven today. Tomorrow, woo, salad, grilled fish and brownies and French fries. <laughs> Seven ring of hell for you immediately. <laughs> Not even purgatory. You don't even get to go to purgatory. You just go straight to hell. And the irony of it is you don't have to, there doesn't even have to be a real hell because you make it hell. You then have a demon. You're the one who does the punishing. So now you hate yourself and then you have to punish yourself because of what you did yesterday. So now you've got to go and, I don't know, run seven miles and drink juice today only. And uh, I don't know, not go to dinner and God forbid, not eat the chocolate, you know, or not have the slice of cake at the friend's birthday celebration. I'm not allowed to do that. And that then creates the restriction, which then increases the resistance to not being able to have it, which then drives the binging, which then drives the moral story. And that, you know, and so we literally are trapped in one of the seven rings of diet and food hell our whole lives. And the reason why diets don't work long-term is because what you're focusing on is the weight. So if I go on a diet because I want to lose 10 pounds, it usually starts off with, I can't believe how fat I am. I can't close my jeans. Oh my God, I've got to lose these 10 pounds. I'm so fat. My focus is on the fat, right? So now I find a solution for the fat, this restrictive diet, whatever it is. So I think I'm focusing on the solution. But by weighing myself and measuring myself and keeping tabs of how much of that fat is going where it's going, and in actual fact, I'm less focused on the fat that I've lost than I am on the fat that I still have. And the closer I get to, that's why those last three or four pounds are always impossible to lose. A, because most people underestimate what they think they need to weigh, first thing, because those weight tables are a lot of bollocks. Okay, I can tell you that now. <laughs> And secondly, because the closer you get, the more you focus on the pounds that are still there and your focus creates your reality. So you might tough it out and lose those pounds, 
But because the insecurity that's driving the, I need to lose the 10 pounds, whatever that is that you believe about yourself, I'm not worthy unless I weigh a certain amount on a scale. So if my worth is determined by the number on the scale, but I don't believe that I'm worthy, ultimately I'm going to recreate those 10 pounds, maybe 15. Now I'm going to hate myself. So I've never focused on the freedom or the health or the what the hell I want to do with that body. Not what are other people going to think about that body, but what is that body? How's that body going to help me carry out my purpose in the world? That's why it's important to have the purpose, right? Now, if your purpose is to be the most beautiful physical specimen based on the cultural version of what beautiful specimen is, like, you know, supermodel, then you will, I'm not saying supermodels find it easier not to eat. Okay, And again, I'm not saying all supermodels don't eat, all right? Because I know that that's a... <laughs> But the fact of the matter is, if you have a friend, you know, that's more supermodel-esque, that you've noticed is actually very disciplined with his or her eating and tends to eat very little, and others are doing all the moral correct things with food. If the person's very identity, their reason for existing is dependent on how they look, do you think that they're going to be more disciplined or less disciplined about food? They're going to be more disciplined about food. They're going to be prepared to suffer more. Definitely. Okay. Whereas I might say, well, you know, I would love to look like a supermodel. But would I love to eat like a supermodel? No. Partly because in my mind, the story is you can only look like a supermodel if you deprive yourself and you restrict and you don't eat anything. And, well, I don't want that. I don't want to look like a supermodel enough. I think I do, but actually I don't. I actually don't. Because if I did, I'd be doing it. So it's complicated. It is very complicated. But the focus should be on the body that you want to create rather than the food you're eating and the pounds you're losing. But you see, if your end result is, I want to lose 10 pounds because it'll make me more confident. Can you see that that's a choice that you've made from your cage, right? So, but let's say my end result is, okay, so I mean, so I poll, right? And honestly, I'm like a pole addict now, right? Dreadful addict, but I just love it. And the reason why I love it is because I've always thought that I was a brain, you know, not really that much on the body. And, you know, my body's a little bit, lot slower than my brain. And I think that if I can haul my body, which is not an inconsiderable body, I can tell you, up a pole, that is amazing. Okay. So the other day I thought to myself, now, I mean, years ago, I promised myself never going to go on a diet again, ever in my life, ever. Right. And I've stuck to that probably for about 15 years. And I thought to myself, you know what? I wonder how much easier it was fleeting. <laughs> I didn't really do anything about it. I wonder what difference it would make to my polling ability if I lost 10 pounds. So if poll, I mean, I'm just using poll as an example. It's not my life purpose, right? But if poll is something that my my soul is longing to express itself through, right? And so what is it about? It's about strength and it's about grace and it's about dancing and it's about movement and it's about the music. Okay, so if that is truly what my soul is longing to express and that's what I'm focused on and I'm aware of what my current structures are and my habits are that are holding me back, and I make different choices, I may well lose the 10 pounds. But it's not about the 10 pounds. So if the 10 pounds is I've got to lose 10 pounds, because you know, when you poll, you have to wear very little clothes, because there's more views on the poll, the less likely you are to plummet to your death on the floor. (laughs) If it's like, okay, well, I have to lose 10 pounds so that my stomach doesn't look quite so offensive in the poll outfit. Well, that's not a sole choice. That's me wondering about what everyone else is going to think about my stomach. Whereas let's imagine that I had these like dreams of being a competitive polar right? Honestly, it's like being an athlete, right? So if I was going to be an athlete, hell, I'd be more motivated to really focus on what is it going to take to become an athlete? Why? I want to be a pole athlete. So every time I'm going to be faced with a food choice, it's like, I want to be a pole athlete. And it's not like, okay, well, I'm eating this because I'm not allowed to eat anything else. I'm eating this because I'm choosing this because it's a step in the direction of becoming a pole athlete. That's what I'm doing. So it's not actually about the food. It's never about the food. It's about your choice. And that's the only way it will work long term. Exactly. Yes. And Loretta, you work with people from all walks of life. You work on on this whole dieting piece. You work on the soul choices. You also work with cancer patients, people with life-limiting diseases or life-changing diseases. What would be the one most important piece of advice you would give to them? Okay, well, I tell them two things. I tell them that... First of all, the disease is just a label and it's feedback. So nobody consciously creates a disease, okay? It's, it's, nobody does that consciously. Nobody wants to be sick, right? One of our fundamental choices is to be healthy and vital. 
so there's no blame and shame in this, but it is, first of all, that disease, signs and symptoms, they're like a GPS. The GPS tells you that you've actually taken the wrong turn off and that you've got to be rerouted. And so if you can look at it that way, if you can stop looking at it as if it's personal, as if it's a punishment to you, you know, as if this is something that you've created because you've been a bad person or whatever the case may be. So if you can just step back, separate the data from the drama, the drama is how this disease makes you feel. It terrifies me and all the rest. The data is you have some data points that are indicating that something in your life no longer serves you. It's just feedback. So when the GPS says we've taken the wrong route, we don't smash the GPS and break down crying on the side of the road. We maybe break down crying on the side of the road for five minutes and then we let the GPS reprogram itself and reroute itself and then we follow what the GPS is going to say. So disease is a label. The bunch of signs and symptoms that are a label, you confer power on that label. So you need to choose. Are you going to give the disease label the power or are you going to take the power? Now, you don't have to know how. You just need to make that as a choice. I'm going to take the power. Okay, because we can work with that. And the second thing is that you are, if you could create it, you can heal it. So you may have unconsciously created it. If we can find out how that was unconsciously created, and if we can remove the resistance to you getting out of the cage, you can uncreate it. And by uncreate it, I don't always mean heal it as in like, you know, the cancer goes into remission or, you know, you you don't ultimately die. Because I know that this sounds harsh, but, you know, we're all on the travel later to death. <laughs> Everybody. Now, none of us are going to get out of here alive. And so healing is not always in not dying. Healing can often be in getting to a place where dying becomes a beautiful transition. Like some births can be highly traumatic and they need lots of intervention and they emergencies and their pipes and their doctors and there's like there's mayhem, there's lots of stuff going on. Some births are like that and some births happen with a lot of pain and screaming and all the rest, but you know, quietly, no complications, easy enough delivery. We can go off the travel later, kicking and screaming, or we can go off the travel later, I do believe differently. And so so it's not about do you get better? It is, okay? <laughs> it can be, but that's not always an indicator of you. I've seen people who have healed enough to let go, to die peacefully. The when you focus on the illness, cancer is a good example of this because you know we're talking to how people fight. You know, someone, um, a celebrity in South Africa has just recently died, right? And and had stage four cancer and was a much loved celebrity. And I saw a headline yesterday. It was about a cancer warrior. And we are told to fight because the, the, the opposite of that is, is like giving in and then just, you know, that means that you're definitely going to die. But um, in the fighting, we very often miss the message. And you can't get the feedback when you're busy fighting. Right? It's very difficult. You've almost got to get still. It's almost like, it's like you've got to accept it, that it's there. That's the reality. Don't deny that it is what it is. You've got to accept the reality. And how do you really feel about it? Unfortunately, this idea that we have to be uh, have such a positive mindset means that many people that have got really serious diseases um, cannot actually get real. They're not, they don't feel like they're allowed to truly say how they're feeling about it, how terrified they are, how hopeless they sometimes feel, how hard it is, because they almost feel obliged to have a positive attitude. Because if you don't have a positive attitude, then it's not going to work. Well, it's not your attitude. It's your focus. So if you're focusing on fighting the disease, your focus is on the disease. If you focus on the health you're creating and the why, why are you creating this health? What are you going to do with this life that you're fighting for? What would you love? Because the one is fighting is I'm fighting it because I'm terrified. So one is we're trying to create from fear. That's the cage because the cage is trying to keep you safe. And the other one is trying to create from love because this is what I would love. So, you know, just to use my poll example again, I would love to be able to do X, Y, Z, right? If I realize that my weight is the limitation for me to do X, Y, Z, and I would love to do X, Y, Z, I'm focusing on X, Y, Z, right? There's a very good chance that the weight will do what it needs to do because I will make, it won't just disappear while I eat seven donuts every day. I'll stop wanting to eat the donuts. I'll choose to eat something other than the donuts, and it's the same with the disease. Thing. The, the disease thing is a little bit more difficult because it's very emotive, you know? Your family is involved and it's difficult to be honest and truthful without seeming unsympathetic or empathetic. But you know, me empathizing is not going to help you create what you love. That's what support groups are for. 
That's what support groups are for. That's why support groups are really useful because you know you're not alone and they can understand what you're going through. Okay, so I'm not part of the support group. I'm part of the team. I'm team. You can create whatever you would love. But in order for us to do that, we've got to get you to recognize the cage. Most people don't even know they've got bars around them. So you first have to recognize that. And then when we open the door, you've got to crawl to the end of the perch. You've got to jump off without quite knowing that you're going to make it. That's the value of having a coach because the person in the relationship that has the most certainty is the one that has the power. And I don't mean like overpowering power. So if you are ill and you are feeling hopeless and despairing, but I've seen a hundred people with the similar illness that you've had. And of those hundred people, let's just say I've seen 60 of those hundred people actually get well. Can you see, I have a different story about the illness than you have, right? I have like, you could be one of the 60. I've seen 60 other people do this. You could probably do this too. I'm sure of that. And so my surety holds, it's almost like I'm holding the place for you while you get your resistance out of the way and start getting more and more sure. That's the value of having somebody helping you do that. And that's something that people don't often think of, you know? So we think of like coaches, like trainers, you know, they train you or they make you better or they teach you another technique or they give you another tool. The truth is, I think that the largest job that the coach is doing is being certain in your uncertainty because that helps you even if you don't know it. That's very powerful when it comes to healing because healing from a physical, especially a serious label, it's terrifying. There's a lot of fear involved. It's very personal. You know, it's, it's not like, you know, your marriage, you can walk away from your marriage. You can't walk away from yourself. You're the most vulnerable person in your whole life. Everyone else who doesn't like you can get away from you. You can't get away from you. You're stuck with you. And so that's what makes it so tricky. The thing that I really love the most is helping those sick people get out of their cages. Because I think that, not because I think it's such a challenge, you know, it's like, oh, it's a, I would rather not have to do that actually. But because when people step into their true power and they see that you can affect the change, literally you're changing your own physiology. Honestly, they become unstoppable. Those people become unstoppable in the world. That's so exciting. If people were to adopt one habit, one daily habit, what would you recommend? I would recommend that they have somewhere in their morning routine, like uh, sit down and just be honest about what exactly is the reality of your life today. What are you thinking about what you have to do? What are you feeling? So, you know, let's just say I wake up and I've got like, I don't know, four clients today. So, you know, I don't really want to write like, Ugh, I don't feel like seeing four clients <laughs> because I mean, what does that look like? This is my business. I'm supposed to love my clients, right? Okay. <laughs> but the truth is, if I don't actually own that, if I don't name it, it's going to be subtly running the show. So if I can sit and just name it and go, you know what, my husband being a dick at the moment, not loving him that much and it's okay. Or I'm really excited about seeing my clients, but the idea of the next marketing campaign that I have to run, or, you know, I have to do this talk, of, I don't feel like doing that or whatever, just the reality of it. And what, why? Like, why do I not want to do that? Why do I not want to see these four clients? Well, the reason why I don't want to see these four clients could be because I feel like I'm pressured because I'm starting, I feel like I'm responsible for their progress. Okay. But then I recognize, oh, Loretta, that sounds like a cage issue, doesn't it? Yes, it absolutely sounds like my own insecurity. It's my insecurity of not being good enough. So when I've seen it and I've named it, I'm like, okay, so it's not actually that I don't want to see my clients. It's that my insecurity is at play here. So I connect to my higher self and I, and I basically connect to what's my higher self's view of what is going to happen with these clients today. And so I just choose to serve myself and them to the best of my ability. And honestly, I never, ever have a day where even if I've thought like, oh, I don't really feel like doing this, that I've seen the clients, that I don't feel better after seeing the clients. I get the healing from the clients because I get to be in my zone of genius or the, my zone of joy or whatever you want to call it, right? So I know that now. So when I go like, ugh, three clients this afternoon, like back to back and only ending at seven o'clock tonight, I'm like, yeah, but how did you feel the last time you did this? I felt amazing. Okay, great. Let's go and do this. So if you're going to do one thing, spend 10 minutes just naming what is true for you today. Just being 100% honest with yourself. Because when you do that, you bring it from the unconscious into the conscious. And then you can choose differently. You can choose to reframe it however you want. That's a really great piece of advice. Last question. You are setting up clinics across South Africa. What is your vision? Okay. So the reason why I hang my head like that is because in the last two years, I've like I've asked myself a million times, why the actual, I'm not going to say the very bad word, are you doing this? Okay. 
So in South Africa, our healthcare system in the rural areas is strained, right? And um, people don't have access to healthcare. Some of them do, some of them don't. More especially, they don't have access to transportation to get them to where they can actually have access to healthcare. And so our clinics and stuff are not particularly well funded and they're not particularly well run. Also, there is a, in South Africa, we have a regulatory body that regulates complementary medicine. So chiropractors, homeopaths, osteopaths, naturopaths, they're all regulated. We're regulated in this country. We have a regulatory body. But we're only about, I forget now, but about 4,000 practitioners. And, you know, there are probably about 60,000 medical practitioners in South Africa. So this is not a complementary medicine versus allopathic medicine. It's just that we are so small, no one takes any notice of us. But we have master's degree qualifications and we are registered diagnosticians. So we can actually, I mean, I can diagnose diabetes in someone, for example, or send them to a path lab for tests and stuff. And so we have a whole part of our healthcare sector, qualified homeopaths, osteopaths, naturopaths, cardiotherapists, who are not being utilized in primary healthcare. And the cost per patient to treat someone homeopathically in a homeopathic community clinic, because we've got a very good pilot clinic that's been running for five years now. So we've collected lots of data from there is that it costs on average about 300 rand per patient to treat a patient homeopathically at this particular clinic. And in the government hospitals and clinic, it costs about 3,000 rand per patient on average. So 10%, at 10% of the cost, we could make an enormous difference. And most of the people in rural areas are women and children. So, you know, if we can improve the health of the children, if we can improve the health of the women, the children, the old people, and the, you know, the, the elderly become the sort of burden on the state health sector and all the rest. So those are the people that we're targeting. I mean, talking to everybody. So because we're not, we don't have an, a national health, they are instituting a national health, but the chances of us being included in there are extremely slim. This initiative was started called Cooler Natural Health. And as I said, the pilot um, project was started not by me at all, by, um, my husband and wife team. The, the husband is a Swiss homeopath and his wife, South African trained homeopath. And um, they started Kula uh, KZN, nat- Kula Natural Health, in the village of Kula. Kula means welcome, I think, in Zulu, and uh, near St. Lucia, in, rural, in a rural part of South Africa, far away from where I live. And so I thought, well, actually, this is the legacy that I would like to leave in that I would like to make healthcare, primary healthcare, holistic healthcare available to as many people in the rural areas of South Africa as possible. And so to that end, I am starting a branch of Kula Natural Health in my backyard, it's not in my backyard, but it's about 15 kilometers down the road from where I live because I live on the outskirts of the town. And it's been a trial. It's taken three years to get the project to fruition. And they are going to strip the roof of the building and start the alterations next Monday. Oh my gosh, that's so exciting. So once we get that going, the model is that, you know, that it, it runs for one week out of every month, which means that people can, you know, come back every month and get their medication. They pay 10 rand to see a doctor and get their medication. 10 rand is about 50p, and that includes the medication and everything else that they have. And then they can come back, obviously, a month later, the three weeks later, they come back and then they can be seen for their follow up and, and so on. And the idea, my idea is to actually start a mobile unit so that we can actually send the units to different rural areas for a week out of every month, which means that we can employ some young doctors full time because they'd be prepared to travel, right? You know, one week in a different place, you know, a week in a different place in the area. And then once that is running, because it it all depends on private funding, obviously. So money is always the limiting factor. But once it's running, it's much easier. You know, it's much easier for someone to give you money if they know that it's real, right? Then I'm like, oh, I have this idea to start this clinic in Africa. I wouldn't give anyone money for that either. And once it's running, then we can start one. I live in a massive province and, and I think it's the second poorest province in South Africa. So the healthcare need here is massive, but the healthcare need in Southern Africa and Africa entire, you know, in its, in itself is huge. So starting them is the problem, getting in, getting the community, finding a venue and the internal politics in the rural villages is, is quite a thing, but I know how to do that now. So my aim is to get this one running and by the end of the year, have it staffed and I don't have to be involved in the day to day and then I can start the next one. And then I can start the next one and then I can help someone start the next one in the next province. And so that's what I have to do before I die because I don't want to lie on my deathbed, A, worrying about the brownies and the chocolate I never ate and (laughs) how much difference it could make in my life. Honestly, I'm not doing that. Life's too short. And B, not having actually at least attempted this. So that's what I'm doing. Well, you are more than attempting it. It's, It's happening and that's a very worthy end result to be looking at. So thank you so much, Loretta. You're very welcome. John Demartini put it, you can either be a victim of your history or a master of your destiny. So thank you so much for your time today, for enlightening us, for informing us, 
for imparting your wisdom. It has helped me so much, as you know, since we started talking. And I'm really excited for more people to hear about it. So thank you. Thank you for letting me bang on about myself for an hour and a half. (laughs) You've been listening to Bandwidth Conversations. Thanks to Anna B, Head of Marketing, to Matthew Passy and all of the podcast consultant, to Bagawai for the music, to the Money Maze podcast. Thank you for listening. Any feedback, please email me, katie at bandwidthconversations.com. Please sign up on our website, www.bandwidthconversations.com, so we can notify you about new podcast releases. We hope to see you again soon.